human trafficking and revenge porn, pornography. And a couple of times the argument that, that these are not only issues about women, for there are many females involved in revenge porn and human trafficking. The government uh, kept coming back. And my question of course is what if, what if it was only about women? Should we uh, care less or care at all? So that's one uh, open question. But I will be now set up and I, I start the floor to Anne Roth, she will be the moderator. And she's a uh, researcher working at um, the committee of, uh, the inquiry on mass surveillance at the German Bundestag. So please. Uh, um, hello, um, I'm, I'm very pleased and very honored to be able to moderate this exciting panel um, on feminist approaches um, and perspectives on privacy. And I totally agree with what you just said that, uh, that uh, even though the, the topics of the morning um, do relate to women, but not only to women, um, it left open the question for what are the feminist perspectives on privacy. This is something that was not discussed in the morning, so I'm very, very happy that we have the chance and some very excellent speakers to get uh, some very different viewpoints, I think, on, on specific aspects. Um, of course, feminist perspectives on privacy is, is a huge topic that cannot be covered in one, cannot be covered in one conference. It's already the definition of what would be the feminist perspective in itself, I think, uh, would uh, be rewarding for a conference. But um, I'm very glad that uh, the CPDP has um, this whole um, strand of, of discussion today here in this room. Um, I hope you can hear as well. It's a bit unfortunate that there's no microphones, but I hope this is going to work anyways. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it, it is a great introduction. And uh, the first speaker who will talk to us is uh, um, <coughs> Valerie Steves of the University of Ottawa. Hi. Um, can you hear me at the back? OK, yeah. great. Um, about four years ago, um, my colleagues Jane Bailey, Chris Reagan, and Jackie Bertel and I started a project called the E-Girls Project. And um, we, were, we wanted to go collect some qualitative data from girls between the ages of 15 and 22 about their experiences of privacy and equality on social media. <coughs> um, we were really interested in testing um, a theme that was coming up in a lot of the feminist literature, that this kind of technology, social media, would be inherently empowering for girls. Um, primarily because it was argued it was a place where they could experiment with their identities, and then they could challenge stereotypes, become publishers rather than just consumers of popular culture. So to a certain extent, I think we wanted to kind of revisit McGraw's notion of the um, <coughs> of veggie culture. Um, so uh, you, you may remember that in the 1970s, cultural studies was really focused exclusively on boys. Girls were being ignored. And instead, um, a lot of focus was on the ways that boys would appropriate public spaces and resignify them for their own purposes through things like graffiti, that kind of thing. So uh, McRobbie, working with Garber at the time, said, well, girls don't have access to the public sphere. They're more highly regulated, but they do have access to the private sphere. And it's in the privacy of their bedroom that they appropriate this cultural material and experiment with it and use it for their own purposes. And when she looked at it in the, in the 70s, she said it's really important that one of the things that you note about the bedroom is that it's, it's distantiated. There are telephones, so you can talk to your girlfriends in a different place. There are radios that bring popular culture into your room. And then you, um, you're in this space where you can explore what that culture means to you and perhaps construct your own resistive identities. So um, I think that conceptualizing this bedroom as a resistive space, as a space of resistance, um, has the potential to really put privacy and communications into dialogue with equality and in productive ways. Um, the argument was, and it's, it's one, of the, one of the things I hope to discuss with you to see what you think about this, that privacy can actually promote equality because it can create a boundary um, or a bounded space where girls can retreat from the pressure of the public sphere and produce their own cultural meanings and potentially challenge restrictive uh, stereotypes. So with the advent of the internet in the 1990s, a number of scholars picked up on this notion of, of, of bedroom culture. Um, Lincoln, for one, argued that new um, information communications technologies were blurring the boundary between the public and private spheres. Um, it was more permeable. So the wired bedroom, um, she argues, has become a hybrid space that's got attributes of both the public and the private, and that this makes it even more empowering for girls because they can retreat, get the benefit.
benefits of bedroom culture, but then they can increase their access to uh, the public sphere. Um, so this is the kind of thinking we wanted to test, and we wanted to find out what girls were actually experiencing. So we started by saying, well, to tell you the truth, all we were doing was trying to put together a discussion guide. We started with an informal scan of 1,500 um, uh, social media profiles of girls, it's okay, we have research assistants, uh, of girls that were ostensibly between the ages of 18 and 22 who lived in Ottawa, which is the city I live in. And, and we naively went out going, this is great, we'll see all the kinds of girls that are out there, there's political girls, there's this girl, there's that, no, there wasn't. There was an homogenous type of femininity. Um, it was a girl who played very careful attention to makeup, very, very careful attention to fashion, and conformed to what you would see in fashion magazines. Um, uh, photos were very clearly intended to emphasize thinness. The duck face was popular, still is. Um, but people now laugh about it. You know, you know, you suck in your cheeks, and it's really bad when a 55 year old woman does it. Uh, but because it emphasizes thinness. Uh, huge territory on these profiles was given to the boyfriend. Oh, Johnny, I love you so much, baby. It's been three months. You're my love boat. That kind of thing. Um, a lot of talk about mainstream popular culture, shopping, travel. Twilight was popular at the time. It was all over the place. And, and we were really depressed. And we thought, well, maybe it's different. We were. We were very depressed. Um, maybe it's different when you look at private profiles, because we made the research decision not to look at private profiles because of the ethics of it. And we're privacy scholars, so we thought we should ask. Um, and our, our, so we sit down with all of our research participants and they go, huh, you know, what's your page look like? She's a lot like that. That's an ordinary girl. When you go online, that's what girls' pages look like. Um, in fact, we had an incredibly diverse group of girls and young women. They were diverse racially, they were diverse ethnically, they were diverse linguistically, they were diverse linguist, uh, religiously. And yet all of us told them that you have to reproduce that online at least to some degree, and especially in high school because it's a social safety net. If you don't reproduce that, you will be slammed. If you don't want to reproduce it, you at least have to have friends on your friends list who do it really, really well, or else people will call you a loser. <coughs> now these girls said they wanted to be themselves online, but they really felt constrained by the need to fit within this very narrow, homogenous, stereotypical representation of that community. Um, the space they described to us, and I wish I had time to go through the data because it's really disturbing, but fun. <coughs> Um, it's a, it's a, social media is a highly disciplined, uh, disciplined space where girls are held to unrealistic standards of beauty, but also unrealistic standards of behavior. Um, and it's very, very gendered, this phenomenon. So all of our research participants agreed that, quote, boys get away with murder online. Guys can put up pictures where they just rolled out of bed and their hair is crumpled, um, where they're being goofy and making funny faces, where they're rude, um, where they are mean to people, where they play jokes. If a girl does that, we were told, oh my God, you are just going to attract the wrath of everyone around you down on you. Um, over and over again, they said, I have to be really, really careful because if I put up the wrong kind of picture or if I say something wrong, then I'm going to be opened up to incredibly harsh judgment. Now, most of their concerns revolved around, not all of them, but most of them concern, their concerns revolved around the signifiers of sluttiness. Um, we were told that there, it was amazing how contested their bodies were. On the one hand, they had to appear to be a little bit sexy. Pretty and a little bit sexy is, actually I wrote a paper called that because it's one of the folks from one of the girls that can capture that. But it could be too sexy because then you were slut. And what made it really, really difficult was the markers of pretty and sexy and the markers of slutty, I, I, I couldn't tell the difference. Lots of boobs. One was pretty, one was slutty, and I couldn't tell you what the difference was. So they were constantly <coughs> on this razor edge of trying to portray the right level of sexiness, not to fall over the slut line. Um, they were also attacked for performances where photos showed them that they were too fat, for example. That was a huge issue. Um, uh, if they disclosed too much information about themselves, they, then, then they would be labeled needy, annoying, self-absorbed, and my favorite one was attention force. Now at the same time, they're there because they need to get a certain amount of attention. They want the publicity, but they have to look like you're not doing it on purpose. Because if you look like you're doing it on purpose, then, then you'll just get destroyed. So it's this artless presentation of a particular kind of femininity which was highly stereotypical and very, very narrow. It was the opposite of what we hoped to find when we first started our scan. Now, interestingly enough, they saw this as a privacy problem. Privacy from 
their perspective, was not about controlling or, or, or not disclosing information about themselves. Uh, what they wanted to be able to do was draw the lines between their audiences. So when they were fooling around with their girlfriends, they weren't accountable to their great aunt. And when they were talking to their grandmother, their boyfriend wasn't going to be paying attention to what they were saying. Um, they also had a number of strategies that they had created between friends to help them protect their reputations as they navigated through this. But most of their discussion focused on two things. And I'll summarize really quickly. The first is that they were very reflexive about the impact of media stereotypes in the online world. And the second one was they were increasingly <coughs> uncomfortable with corporate surveillance. And those two are linked. So if you were at the porn panel, we found out that porn, porn advertisers are no different than any other advertiser. They profile people so they know how to target advertise them with the products they want to sell to them. Advertising uses stereotypes because they're codes. So a stereotypical image conveys a lot in a very short period of time. And since these, these commercial messages are based on the information that the, the advertisers and marketers collect about girls as they go about living their life online, and then they put them right back into their social environment, it privileges the position of these stereotypes. So from a data protection point of view, certainly in the Canadian context, I think we have to ask some really hard questions. Data protection in Canada was designed to legitimize corporate collection and commercial collection of information. These girls ostensibly consent, and yet it's created an environment in which that permeability of the bedroom wall is really not working in their favor. So I think we instead need to think about tools, technical tools and regulatory tools we can give girls that will reassert the ability to firm up that wall so they can get the benefits of private spaces for self-reflection, but also have access to the public sphere in a way where they can actually enjoy equality instead of be subjected to this kind of gender judgment. Thank you. Um, 
um, and kind of persuaded to reflect on their smoking behaviours and how that might impact on, on others. So this has been used with various different populations in the UK, um, trialled and, and with people with um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, but particularly pregnant women. Um, so that's that's a, the case study that I'm going to talk about, um, particularly the, the issue of gender there being um, women who are um, targeted. Uh, I would just like to say women, pregnant women seem to be more receptive to this than other populations, and that might be uh, hopefully we'll have a couple of minutes in the discussion for, for various different reasons um, that are specific to women. Um, so this is a, a project that I've been involved in. It's a, a feasibility study. So it is a research study. It's not something that's being rolled out by the NHS by any means. It's, it's basically some clinicians with an interest in the technology um, and working with air quality specialists to, to stick this into homes. What I would argue is this is actually a form of surveillance um, and an intrusion to privacy in some respects. Um, however, what we're seeing is when this is being offered to women, um, it, it's, it seems to be quite popular. So we've got a case study in, in Aberdeen where about um, a third of pregnant smokers who were um, <coughs> approached by a midwife at their first scan were offered, do you want to take this flat box into your home and, and plug it in for three or four days? Uh, about a third say yes. Um, and in Coventry, where we've been working with maternity and health lifestyle service, thank you. Um, Again, we're looking at uh, upwards of, of a third um, of women saying, yeah, I'll take it, yes, please. Um, so in both these contexts, I should also say that these women are also being routinely monitored for carbon monoxide. So when they present at um, a hospital setting for a maternity appointment or a midwife visits them at home, they're being asked to go into a monitor at every um, contact point um, to, to be monitored for their uh, carbon monoxide level to indicate the presence of smoking, whether or not they smoke, <coughs> I should add. So even if you're asked, do you smoke, they will still be asked to go into the monitor and, and check. Um, so there is this kind of routine surveillance already ongoing, but over and above that, this added, uh, this add-on um, about a third of women seem to say yes. Of those third of, of women, about four-fifths actually complete the measurements. They take the black box home and then plug it in, leave it on for three or four days, take it back or have it collected, and then are given the, the graph. Um, it, some don't. Um, unfortunately, we don't have contact with those women. I, I think it would be interesting to, to find out why they, why they don't. In Aberdeen, this has been a very light touch um, kind of exercise, um, and we're looking at a rate of about 11% of, of women who did this actually recording quit in smoking. Bearing in mind, this is to, supposed to bring about a change in smoking behaviour. Um, and in Coventry, about half. And then I do the qualitative interviews with the women who have who gone through this. So to think about bringing some critical feminist observations to the table, firstly, who, when well, we're talking about women, um, they're, they're the ones coming and presenting for these appointments and being met by the, the health professionals. Um, although the, the women are mixed, uh, we're very often seeing younger women, women li living in areas of relative deprivation, um, and often non-white or non-British women um, who, are, who are saying yes. Uh, so we're looking at not just gender here, but intersectionality of other characteristics um, in this kind of population. So for them, it seems that detailed, personalised data about their home and the place that they're living in seems attractive. But does yes really mean no? So although for some, gen there is a sort of genuine participation where our findings are suggesting that the <coughs> black box in the home is actually helpful for some people who already want to quit and they're taking it on board as a, an add-on to the service, something that's a, um, a kind of freebie almost, um, that's giving them a helping hand. But we also see it, that's kind of come out in the interviews that um, evidence of guilt, pressure, um, quite often desperation, and force in, in one case, there um, was one woman I spoke to, she actually had her, her two previous pregnancies, two children had been taken into care, and she was um, being threatened by a court order that she had to give up smoking if she was to keep her, her baby, it would not be taken away from her um, as it was born. And so to prove that she had quit smoking, she was really keen to have this black box because it added evidence to her case um, that, that she had quit smoking. So women are explicitly consenting to take this black box home. No one is going into their home and plugging it in. Um, they're, they're signing forms and agreeing to it, and they're going through the usual procedures. And there is, of course, governance around this. We have ethics approval. Um, the clinicians uh, um, present it to NHS ethics boards, and you know, it's all, all of our board and the way the data is governed. But is that meaningful for women in these contexts? 
Also, there are wider domestic and relationship issues. Um, so quite often the woman might seem keen, but the home that she's taking the device into is maybe not so keen, so she has a partner or family who actually say, no, get this out, switch it off, I don't want it. Um, and also women who are very struggling against others who are smoking in the home, so their partner who may be smoking and they're using the graph and saying, this is the air quality in the home, I don't want this for my child or my children. And then struggling using the, this sort of data as a, almost a gendered weapon. Um, in situations of frustration and, and abuse. And again, although um, approximately four fifths actually completed the measurement, there are issues around that as well. So many actually disengaged the minute they were presented with that graph. So we're looking at, this is the personalized data in your home and the way that they were given that information, there might be issues of literacy and numeracy in, in kind of trying to process that. But also, you know, it, it's been for, um, in, in those kinds of ways, but although, a lot of embarrassment and um, expressed by the women who participated in interviews. So what about the women who actually didn't? They, they disappeared and went off the radar. <coughs> Were they worried about repercussions in terms of their health care or um, other things that, that might result um, as unintended consequences? Having said that, there were also women who really appreciated the extra care and contact. And so, of course, we, we need to talk about rights and responsibilities when generating and communicating this kind of data um, and, and its meaningfulness to women. Thank you. Um, also thinking about the enemy within, so the safety and the privacy of the home can actually become an ostensibly controlled space. So it might be perceived as surveilled by government agencies, so whether the kind of um, customer interface, as it were, is the NHS, although this is a research project and a feasibility project, you're looking at something that looks like the government actually sat in your living room, perhaps, you know, uh, watching what you're doing in your own home and generating this data about smoking behaviour, air quality. What does it all mean? Um, and how does that fit with conceptualisations of care? Also, the lack of control and decision-making power that a person might already have, that a woman might already have in her own home. So you're having added health professional presence um, as a you know, part of the course of taking part in a research project. And we all understand that taking part in research isn't necessarily the same as something that becomes routine care, but you know, where, where does this end and, and what happens um, if something like this does become routine, as it were? And is there a perceived reduction of qualitative experiences and deeply personal context to the collection and consumption of previously unseen data? We wouldn't have this data if it were not for those black boxes going into homes. <coughs> so even though there might be intended positive purposes, can we guarantee them? And of course there's a normalisation of new surveillance technologies, which people are genuinely excited about in healthcare. You know, um, people have been working in smoking cessation services for years. Um, you know, are really committed to finding <coughs> something that can work, and um, this perhaps shows some some um, promise. But is it proportionate, and are there alternatives? So, for discussion, and um, sorry, I'm aware that we're running out of time. Um, surveillance of uh, women in their own homes is surprisingly not unproblematic, um, even where interventions are um, well-meaning and designed to improve relevance and accessibility of health services, with the genuine aim of improving health. Um, you know, surveillance is gendered. The burden of responsibility is on women. Um, having said that, this kind of data might be crucial to improving services. Participation can be empowering, but issues of feminist concern do need attending to, and um, can women be more involved in creating involvement in kind of informing uh, what might be appropriate in the future? I just want to thank um, some of my colleagues here who are not social scientists, not um, feminist academic scholars, not you know, and that have been very receptive to these kinds of ideas and helped um, with discussing them, even though they're uh, on the call. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. policy-making institution, but uh, having a role within that institution, which is uh, the, the freedom to, to reflexively approach what we are doing. So I'm not in charge of privacy policy, uh, but allowed to think about it, and, and, and I'm happy to share this thought with you. So uh, how, did I came, how did I come to the fact that there is gender in all of this? Uh, well, uh, when a woman looks in the fridge to seek, to, 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 to find something, it seems to be a stupid task. But 
um, when the fridge is programmed so that it recognizes alone uh, if something is missing, then it is a smart fridge. So, so then I, I thought, but why is it that objects are deemed to be smart when they are programmed by often men? And we have to say, um, <laughs> and when, when, when these tasks are being done by women and even men, that's stupid. So. Uh, uh, this really opened up a box and things. There is a lot of things about these representations. And um, then I remember John Fess and Jean-Jacques Rousseau when she said that the decoupling between the public and the private was in fact aiming at men being equal to each other in the public space but remaining dominant at home. And uh, this is uh, uh, indeed true that the access to the public is a recent right for women that homes are draining for women because they are, it's often a space where they are dominated. Uh, and this is why feminists, of course, have coined this slogan, the privé et politique. So this distinction between public and private, which I hear is, of course, being challenged by research on privacy, is still, uh, I think, at the ground of the representation uh, behind this concept. And this is not fit for women as well as it is for men. Because also of the domestic violence phenomenon, where Durish and Bell in their book on divining the future said something which is obvious once you read it, is it, it is that m women encounter more violence at home than in the streets. So there again, home is not a protected space, but the space where you need danger more than outside. So I was wondering, is in fact women's freedom more constrained by the state, as it seems to be for men, the, uh, or by men themselves? And I think that we, our daily experience as women is to sort of negotiate, navigate, uh, are in touch with this danger uh, and deal with it uh, in creative ways. Uh, when, when to say um, so uh, with this background in mind, I, I, there's two options. One is, OK, let's think about And again, I don't blame men for getting through the concept of privacy, which fit their needs. I only wonder why women are so, uh, so silent uh, on, on framing their own. So two options, either, OK, let's now leave men have their own framework and us developing our own, or be more popular about our needs working. Or option two, let's see, uh, let's reshape <coughs> the concept of privacy, re it, as we said in the online initiative, and I welcome Mihaly Duran, who was part of this initiative, uh, to fit hyperconnectivity and, by the same token, be more fit for more e equally for men and women together. So. My, this is my preferred option, and I will then show you how we can do that, maybe. Just a, a suggestion, but rushing through. We all know in this room that the, the, I think the moment where we are, we are living, the moment where in fact ubiquitous computing comes true, so that the distinction between offline and online is blurring, they fall into each other. This is, we are always both off and online, and this, in fact, put us, has two macro characteristics. One is that we have to learn to live as human beings and make a society with sticky interaction, where instead of running, so to speak, in the air, we, we, we run in the water, uh, because all interactions are potentially registered and searchable, and if not today, it will be soon. Or And we have a reactive and talkative environment, and not anymore a sort of virgin nature that we can explore, and that is, and, um, and, and then artifact within. So these two macro characteristics really are so radical change conditions that really we are living the moment where postmodernity is born and not only something recognized in knowledge fields, but that has to be acknowledged in the policy and the politics and for us all, not only as policymakers, but as citizens and people. Our expectation towards politics is much too modern. And so because it is born, it needs to have a name and the name of postmodernity is hyperconnectivity. Okay, so we are shifting from modernity to hyperconnectivity as we speak, and the distinction is that the role that objectivity has played into the modern framing, uh, I think, is now to be sort of substituted by the role that reflexivity is playing in a hyperconnected era. That is, the self is not transparent anymore to ourselves, but uh, we have to stay conscious of it. And it is a shift about the representation of interaction. And both the notion of interaction and the notion of the self, of course, introduce where it's important to keep in mind issues about gender and sex. How do we think about the human in the policy making world here? I'm thinking about this sort of uh, gross approximation of this concept on which we rely to think when we think politics. Uh, what it is to be human, when we think uh, uh, our computer coming close to what it is to be human, and we have the Turing test in mind. Uh, in fact, we use fooling as a proof, because we're saying, OK, a computer can be deemed to be human. If a human is fooled and think, it is a human. Uh, 
Um, and so that when we uh, wonder when robots will become like human, it is just because we forget that we think of humans as if they were machines since centuries. So I just draw the attention that this question of when will robots become human and all the freak out around it only makes sense because we, uh, we, we, we have uh, forget to think about human in a proper way. So the definition of what it is to be human is under stress. We, we hear post-human singularity, all these things. Um, I think that instead of jumping to the post-human directly and throwing the baby out with the bathwater, it's good to stop in this medium um, step and explore a concept of a post-humanistic human. Uh, and this is the opportunity to embrace more equally men and women in their privacy needs, I suggest. I build that, I, I suggest to, to, to do this post-humanistic human, to build it around the notion of plurality that is at the heart of Arendt thinking. And, um, okay, so that the post-humanistic human is inherently plural. And with plurality, I'm sorry for this crash course, for those <laughs> but uh, 10 minutes is not a lot. The coexistence of three characteristics, we are equal, we are equal in the fact that we are unique, and this is an interesting way to articulate diversity and united in diversity, <coughs> and we are partly blind to ourselves, so that we need to appear among others to know who we are. So this notion of the human, for me, substitute for the rational subject uh, figure and introduce instead the notion of a relational self. So the humanistic human still is a man as a rational subject and driven by this omniscience omnipotence utopia, uh, while women um, are, in fact, still very much seen as, uh, as nature, and it was so at the origin, <coughs> and now we are at odds because of this equality, but still we have this in the back of our minds somehow. So that with the relational self, I think that we are on a much more equal basis where men and women can feel if, they, if we connect ourselves much more to this to these characteristics uh, of being a relational self and not a rational subject, this can build a different um, conversation. So that the notion of freedom for rational <coughs> subject, which is often built on being in control, having the skills, being empowered, managing your own personal data, become, <coughs> we have to care for freedom for relational selves. That means for people who know that they depend from others to know who they are and to experience freedom. So it is more about not being controlled, not being fooled, being treated fairly, not being over solicited in terms of attention. There is a, just a different way to look at it that come out of the picture or the landscape. And instead of having transparency and control at our mouths all the time, uh, because we, we, we needed to do that in modern framing, because this was a condition for freedom to some extent. So now it's really much more on focusing on what are the conditions to ensure and experience fairness and avoid fooling. Uh, so this is my last slide, I'm going okay. Uh, um, that this means that uh, privacy and hyperconnectivity should be redefined really around, for example, this dual need that we all have of intimacy and recognition. And this is one of the sentences in the Online Manifesto, paragraph 38. Uh, where, where again, this was something, this, what I share about privacy is not at all, I think, what Nina is saying, but this insistence on the dual need of intimacy and recognition, and the fact to oppose intimacy to recognition instead of opposing privacy to um, transparency or privacy to, um, is really um, something important. So this is a sort of rewording. Now, unfold issues at stake with privacy. Often, I think, when we have issues with privacy, like um, it was in the Canadian school, I think, or it's often to, to have to do with something else that is debated under privacy. For example, are we free, yes or no, to grow soft drugs, okay? Uh, and if we are playing with the rule without hurting anybody, uh, should it be something that is considered to be wrong? But this is more an issue about what is our relationship to the rule? When we decide something, do we think that in the same time we should be allowed to be able to judge ourselves and not only be judged by others if we conform to the rule? So there's a whole big debate about the relationship to the rule that is often sort of neglected and presented as a privacy debate. Um, I think that we, we should have the debate for what they are and not hide things behind a privacy debate. The same if we, 
it, with the IoT, for example, we will soon be in a position where, as drivers, we could have our cars totally tagged and the environment, and we receive at the end of the month a sort of fine for all the things we did wrong, like uh, speed limit. Uh, uh, you can imagine that this is sort of possible. I, I hear people screaming about privacy. It's not about privacy. It is about, am I allowed to play with the rule and to escape? And do I need this somehow? And if yes, what is the margin? So, so it's more about, I think, that kind of thing, that the real thing of privacy there. This being said, we all need intimacy um, because we are not transparent precisely. Uh, and, and this is, and the privacy in, Context, I think the way Helen Nissenbaum reframed privacy, uh, putting context in the center instead of data, I think is really uh, offering the possibility to, to cope with the needs of relational selves, of, of us as relational selves more than as data subject or rational being. And I want to add something to the last thing is the attentional sphere that should be considered part of our integrity. The fact that we live in an overabundant, uh, where information is overabundant and we have all these devices that can drive our attention uh, is potentially damaging for our life experience and for our freedom. We didn't need to single out the fact that attention is scarce and vulnerable because there wasn't the context of all of our information. Now that we are living in this context, I think we have to pay attention to the attentional sphere and to put it as part of the integrity as a fundamental right. <coughs> because if we don't agree together that <coughs> we shouldn't just feel free to drag the attention of everybody all the time to try to maximize our own objectives and incentivize everybody else along our own goals, I think we are going to create a sort of nightmare uh, or, or sort of, um, yes, uh, enfin. No. Okay. That's why it's not nice to have. Oh. Yes, thank you. Uh, so attention is as important as privacy, as defending privacy. Uh, I would say. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>
very open to share the ideas and the ideas which actually uh, uh, challenge the patriarchal notion. So instead of having a discourse on it, the reaction they receive from the other segments of society is really negative and very um, uh, strong um, re uh, reactions. Um, in that case, what happened that their their data in like in form of their pictures, they are being mobbed and photoshopped and put it on the porn websites, and they really don't do not have any legal remedy available because there is no law and policy. Uh, but I would like to mention here some of the names who are actually doing a really good work um, um, in terms of reaching out to these uh, developer co developing countries and uh, doing some very powerful campaigns. Um, Association for Progressive Communication started a couple of years back a campaign which actually addressed the technology related violence against women and uh, the campaign is Take Back the Tech. And under that campaign, they are addressing a lot of uh, um, uh, issues which is actually uh, uh, related to violence happening in the online space. Um, and some of the good material produced by Tactical Technology Collective, um, th they are doing some amazing work and we are using their tra training materials to raise awareness uh, among young women and girls that how they can you know, make themselves secure and safe while using ICTs or internet spaces uh, for different purposes. And um, Association for Progressive Communication have just uh, um, uh, launched 15 uh, principles on internet, uh, family, uh, principles on, uh, uh, of uh, feminist principles on internet. And two of the principles um, are, uh, is related, uh, are related to the privacy and data protection. Uh, the one related to uh, privacy says that surveillance by default is the tool of patriarchy to control and restrict rights both online and offline. The right to privacy and to exercise full control over our own data is a critical principle for a safer open, and open internet for all. Equal attention needs to be paid to surveillance practices by individuals against each other as well as the private sector and non-state actors in addition to the state. And the principle related to data protection says that everyone has the right to be forgotten on the internet. This includes being able to access all our personal data and information online and to be able to exercise control over including knowing who has access to them and under what conditions and being able to delete them forever. However, this right needs to be balanced against the right to access public information, transparency, and accountability. So having said that, um, I, I just wanted to sort of uh, identify the gap uh, between the, you know, the developed world where you know, the notions of privacy and data protection is so much developed and the laws and policies are being implemented. But then there is this part of the world where there is absolutely no understanding, let alone the laws and privacy. So I think there is a need to bridge, bridge that gap and the think tanks who are really active, like I have heard from my uh, colleagues here, I mean, there is, there is a need to you know, sort of do the strong collaborations between this part of the world and global stuff. We have quite a bit of time left, actually, which is really nice. So we have 25 minutes. And I think uh, before I start suggesting what to talk about, I would like to see if there's any comments or questions from the audience. Thank you very much. I'd like to come back to Valerie's talk. And it, it was absolutely fascinating. But I'm a little worried about your conclusion to as it were strengthen the walls of the bedroom <laughs> as a remedy for the problem you mentioned. Because I think a private space as a retreat to, for self-reflection and so on is premised on the possibility to go out then. And I, 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 I say, I'd say a private space must be a retreat and not a refuge where you flee to. And 
this especially is salient in this case because you need that profile anyway. You cannot live as a teenager in high school today without having all those social media representations. So that would, in a sense, it, it sort of resonates with, with issues that have been long discussed in homosexual communities about outing and the politics of outing and the necessity of living a lie or not living a lie. Or to, to, and I, I don't have a solution to that. I was just, I'm just worried that strengthening the walls of the private sphere might be counterproductive in a um, sense. It, it, it's, again, it's hard to say anything in 10 minutes, right? Yeah, sure. you know, I, I, what girls tell us is that they want the control over mm -hmm. when they retreat into a private space and when they enter into public space. So it's not that, that we want a wall and keep them behind it. It's that it's, it's a power claim that I have the right to retreat when I choose to. I have the right to be in public space and not be attacked for what I represent or how I represent myself. So they were very successful in um, professional representations. They, they found this was a really great way to say, hey, I'm selling something or I'm starting a small business. I'd like to get a job, that type of thing. What was interesting to me, so, so obviously, um, uh, if, if you think of McRobbie, the whole idea is to provide girls with access to an equal public space and also <coughs> the ability to withdraw into a private space when they wish and cross that line themselves. Um, and um, um, I, what I found really interesting is that they were successful in their interactions with the public sphere if they erased their bodies. So um, um, many of the teenagers, in fact, I would say all of the teenagers we talked to did choose to withdraw from social media and get rid of their profiles. So it's no longer the case, this technology isn't as new as it used to be, and it's not as much fun as it used to be. So a lot of people say, look, the only thing I could do to get rid of the drama was to just get off of Facebook. Like, screw Facebook, it was ruining my life. I got off for five months, then I went back with a really limited profile. So that's one thing. Um, now, if that means I have to get out of the public sphere altogether, that doesn't sound like equality to me, and I think that's, you know, I, I completely agree with you on that. Um, um, the issue had done thought, I can't remember what it was. It could have been that important. I'll leave it at that. Any more questions? <coughs> which means that it's not just about what data is shared with who, but what inferences you draw from that. And that is connected, of course, with gendered inferences. Uh, what sort of uh, bias is in the algorithm, and that bias is not necessarily because somebody put it there, but if you talk to computer scientists, any algorithm that comes up with something salient is biased, otherwise it comes up with nothing. Bottom line, computer science. So um, for me, transparency, in the modest sense of the word, not in the uh, uh, rationalist sense of the word, but in the modest sense of the word, is a precondition for privacy. Why? Because if you have absolutely no idea which of your data are going to be correlated, put together, what is the half-life of this data, and I'm quoting one of my previous uh, speakers, the think nuclear energy, this has a half-life. Now, data also has a half-life, even if you anonymize it, because of the inferences that are wrong. So for me, it's not privacy against transparency, it's not that privacy is necessarily transparency, Without transparency in the sense of having a clue how you're going to be targeted, and more imaginative, how you might be targeted so that you can start playing around with it, that is when you can make privacy. If you don't have that sort of transparency <coughs> as a woman or as a man, you have no privacy because you're, you're totally in the dark. So, um, so, uh, I um, just wanted to say thank you for this, this panel and um, just the opportunity to even see the word <coughs> feminist sometimes in spaces like this is uh, refreshing and novel. Um, other people may disagree with that. Uh, I'm sure they'll speak as well. 
Um, I, I struggle with the idea of both the way privacy is framed sometimes within feminist discourse as well as ideas of surveillance. So feminism has historically struggled with the idea of what privacy is and whether the personal is political or not. And, um, and even between personal and private, there are you know different languages will interpret that differently. But I think the going into the private space of the home, uh, recognizing women's right to the privacy of their own bodies. I mean, I feel that there are still ideas there in mostly Western feminist theory, but also perhaps in, in other areas. I mean, I know that um, where I come from and in some many parts of the world, sort of going into the private space of the home and being able to talk about things like violence has been a very important. Um, sort of feminist, um, you know, sort of intervention. Uh, so I think it's still kind of muddled there, and it's not so clear cut that what what a feminist discourse understanding of privacy is. I think we a lot of these examples are really interesting to start evolving a new discussion. And similarly with surveillance, where it's actually never just top down. If you think of surveillance more as a continuum, and you have these abilities to sort of control, control from a distance, but also control really up close as the you know, black box in the home as well as this tracking device. In some senses, I would disagree that there's such a big gulf between the global north and south. I think that you, know, you have to kind of see it on this, on this continuum. And um, yeah, I mean, I could kind of go on and on about this, but I just wanted to throw that out. I'm looking forward to other. Uh, do you have questions? Feel free to ask if maybe we have these other two questions or statements, and then we'll see if there's comments from the speaker. So you. Hi, Kristen Salmon from Prayer. I just a common comment with Valerie and Maya said. Um, so just as three examples. Uh, I'm I work in technology, but I also work in Colombia, right? So whenever I work write an op-ed in the Norwegian newspaper on drones. The drone wars is really bad. Then I get emails saying, poor, you hate Israel, you love Hamas, you're like the left extreme, right? So my women in Colombia who are grassroots IDP leaders, they get, you know, stuck in their textbook, Facebook messages or text saying, poor, uh, you're destroying Colombian uh, security state, so you're going to be raped anyway. Right? And then you look at this monk in, in Myanmar who said about you in NYU, he was up for. Uh, and I'm just sort of struck by how this is so similar to the language that girls meet in their everyday life. And this retreat to, you know, literally the divide between public and private. And, and obviously, women in Colombia who get these threats are regularly killed. I mean, this is very, very dangerous. It's a completely different context than what I face. I just get annoyed and delete. And if, if you know if you get a death threat, you go to the police. But, it, but it's a very different context. But but it, it there it seems to be something about sort of the language across the board. And I think I do really take up sort of the activist admonition to you know really look broader because it's becoming quite important. Yes, thank you for this very interesting panel. I like it a lot because it's really. It draws in uh, social science issues, which we often miss in talking about policy and data protection and technology. So I think the context, Iranian context, instead of decontextualizing, context of class, gender, age, cultural values, is very important to understand what privacy really is as a relation to data protection. And in that, this regard, I think, just to make it more common, I think, is that looking at this no notion of online life, so this, what Deleuze calls direct in media, is, is, is important as what you see when investigating people, especially young people, what really matters is social privacy. So what uh, Valerie talked about is how they interact, how they disclose or not disclose certain information and, and how they build up, uh, they express themselves. And this is important if you talk to people about privacy. What's much less important is what happens with the data that comes out of this way of dealing with social privacy. They're, they're kind of lured into uh, data, uh, misuse by the other data by looking at their social privacy and what they think about it. So online talks about how you don't uh, make difference anymore between your online and your offline world and try to cope with it in one way or another and, and uh, try to yeah, have collapsing audiences that uh, you don't know who's looking at you anymore in the online world. But to some extent, this is what worries them, and what worries them much less is the issues about data, and personal data, and data protection, while this sh should worry them more, but it's not of their interest, apparently, when you talk to these people and young people. So 
So I would think it's important then to look at further revolutions within media and social media wearables and other things. Yet it becomes even more problematic in that sense. So I think it's very relevant to talk about these issues by looking at privacy combined with, with other protections where well, two different kind of things when talking to people. There's one more comment and then I'll give the floor to you too. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, thank you very much. I thought this was really exciting not only for the diversity and scope, but also because I'm now really confused. Um, and I'm hoping that some of you will help me resolve the confusion. And I thought the, the primary reason why I'm, I'm confused in a very nice and generative way is because we seem to have bought into the idea that questions of privacy, the public and the private, are tied to questions of doing things. Yeah, so even when you are retreating to the private, it is in order to reflect as if the only way in which you can kind of enter the climate or go back to it is to kind of perform yet another action which will then be uh, in some ways documented. Uh, it, it, it might be in terms of image pornography, for example, somebody else is documenting it and stealing it for you. And I'm being reminded of the work that uh, South Asian feminists have done where they've talked about how historically women were given access to public space because we allowed them to do things. Right? And that when they, when, when they were then allowed to retreat, they were also only allowed to do things within that. And uh, in fact, Shilpa Parke, who's a great friend and a, and a philosopher, is, has this fantastic book called Why Loiter? And she's saying that the, the, the dominion of inequality is actually in the bodies which are allowed to loiter without intention in public, and bodies which are forced to constantly perform actions to justify their presence in the public. And this is something that digital technologies constantly do, right? That the domain of the private of the body is shaking because even what you are doing in the private has to be done, and that there has to be a kind of finite point to it. And and this was this was great to think through as I was listening to all the different panels, and I just wanted to throw it out back at you. Mm -hmm. So, did you want to comment on what you said? Yes. Um, starting from uh, Mihai's point, I I. I I agree, of course, uh, but when you say totally in the dark and transparency in the modern sense of the term, I would say in the today's sense of the term, <coughs> modern, but I think it's um, that, yes, of course, there are bias with inference and um, an algorithm, uh, as it is with scientific knowledge, with everything, but there is never such a thing as a sort of perfect understanding and vision. Uh, so, so I think what we have to take there is that uh, also that there will be mistakes uh, and that all mistakes will not necessarily be um, damaging. Uh, there will also be sort of misunderstanding and, and yeah, you put this sentence of Zizek, like the communication is a successful misunderstanding. So this sort of, um, th this will also be the, and what, so I want to not be obliged as a woman, but as a person, I would say, always to pay attention to the intention of the woman. I think that I can be totally hijacked to wonder what others want out of me and to try to escape that. I want the freedom to live without taking necessarily into account everything that others want about me. Because this is, this is for me something otherwise where I would be totally drawn. Now, and, and on, on what you were saying, I think that is important, and, and in things with doing and speaking, I think that um, misogyny, that when you, when you see the importance we attach to hate speech, uh, for example, but when it comes to misogyny, you're not the first woman that I hear saying, when I receive such speech, I just delete, and I feel that it would worsen the problem if I bring it as a public issue. So we tend individually, when we receive this kind of thing, except if it's murder, to just boom, say, say ignore, okay? So this ignorance as a strategy takes energy, because it's not something that, but this is a strategy that usually we don't use and promote in general. And I think that if women were more vocal about, about the fact that misogyny and all that, it, it, uh, and the right, of the, the right to ignore and also encourage this as a successful strategy <coughs> in some circumstances, some. I don't know which one. I don't know where to draw the line where it's better to ignore and where it's better to mobilize. But I think that sometimes we have to realize the power of, of, of ignoring uh, also. And as women, for our ideas, 
we experience that ideas are not listened to more often than the other way around. Maybe paradoxical to say that when I have the floor, but, uh, <laughs> 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 but okay, uh, if, if you, may, you may see what I mean. And we hear that, that, that um, women are listened to in a different mode so that we tend to worry much more about what others will think about us more than just mm -hmm. utter what we have to say and take for granted that it will be taken into account. So, and they're also about this sort of saturation of information and who is listened to. I think as women, we, are, we feel we are less listened to and if we have on top of this to pay more attention to who is thinking what about ourselves, we have even less space to, to, to experience freedom. So, so that's a little bit why I would like to displace uh, this um, full attention on only one side of the picture and to say, hey guys, there is two sides to the picture and let's also mobilize the, the other. Um, I, I want to make three. Thank you for that. I wanted to uh, make three comments. The first one was in response to the four comment, um, because I think you get to a point in life where you just think, boy, things just don't change. Like it, it's a very, it's a very old story. And man, when you sit down to talk about girls in a privileged country in a privileged position, they're telling the same story, right? Um, and I was really struck with the with your example. Uh, they got about the uh, photo shopping people who have the nerve to say something, women who have the nerve to say something and putting them on porn sites because that's a way of ridiculing and silencing them. Um, and which may, reminded me of what I what I'd forgotten to say. Um, when we talked to the girls that we spoke to, they found that they could be successful when they erased their body. So, so either headshots or far distant shots. And uh, particularly as they hit 21, 22, 23, they said, well, I want to be a professional now, therefore I can't have bikini shots, I can't show anything with me and my boyfriend, I've got my status line cleared out, which is really interesting because they have to erase significant parts of their life in order to gain access to the public sphere and be successful and be thought of serious. And they kept saying, oh, no one will take me seriously. You know, I have to erase my body to be taken seriously. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, Secondly, um, I, I think there's a rich tradition of privacy theory that often doesn't trickle down into con conversations about data protection, um, which is really looking at privacy as a social value. Um, I'd recommend, uh, Beata Rossler is, just published a book called Social Theories of Privacy, I think it's called, but it's, it's just out, and there are a lot of scholars in that um, um, thinking about how to theorize this, and it, it emphasizes um, the relational aspects of privacy. Privacy isn't about data. And even with this Nissenbaum, who I love her stuff, but she talks about, let's put the data in the social context. Whereas, I think if you extend that further, you say, no, actually, let's not talk about data. Let's talk about the relationality between the human actors that are interacting in this case. And too often, especially with online stuff, we pretend that the human actors are gone and it's an algorithm, and algorithms are always biased because we hurt them. Um, and uh, just in that regard, I just wanted to point to some other research that I had done um, with kids. Um, it's a survey of 5,500 <coughs> kids across the country in Canada. And, and repeatedly in qualitative work, they tell us this is their vision of privacy. Privacy is something you negotiate through your interactions with others. I don't want to be invisible. I want to be able to control this line of privacy and publicity. Um, and when we talk about the kinds of regulatory frameworks that are in place, I found it particularly interesting that when we not only ask kids, do companies see you online? They also do, yeah, of course they do. But when we ask them, should they be able to see you online? Should they be able to watch you? Should they be able to take that and use it in any way they want? 75% of the kids we surveyed said the media company, like Facebook itself, the social media company, should not be able to see what they post on their sites. They know it's public, but they think just because you can see it doesn't mean you should. I think we're asking the wrong questions. I think we should ask the normative question. What should companies, governments, be able to do with their data? Not what can they do? Um, then the other one that I found fascinating was when we asked them if marketers should be allowed to see them on social media, 98% said no. Huge, complete rejection of the data protection model for e-commerce in, in North America. It's, it's not that they, they know it's there, they just think it shouldn't be there, which I think is really, really interesting. Lastly, very quickly, I just really wanted to thank you for your intervention about um, Southeast Asian feminism. Um, when you talk about equality being the difference between bodies being forced to perform in public spaces and bodies being left at rest, that to me is that guys get away with murder on social media. Guys can be on social media and nobody even looks. They are allowed to be left, to, to just to sit, yeah. to be at rest. 
And what really comes out of the data that what we've collected is that girls feel this unbelievable pressure to constantly perform in ways that they wouldn't necessarily embrace if they weren't surrounded by these really stereotypical messages. So I just thought that was a fabulous intervention that I want to thank you for. As we're moving towards the end, I would like to ask everyone to be a bit more concise and I wanted to know whether Heather and Nina wanted to add something to what was said. I'd just like to really respond to your point about doing things and, and just thinking about the you know, work that I've been working on is it's sort of being done to you, it's sort of being done to you. Any expectation that you would be receptive to <coughs> what I'm being done to you. Um, and kind of playing off of the benefits um, that may or may not be direct. Um, that, that there is an expectation there of performance um, in the private space. I think that's really important. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yes, I comment on this, uh, that it's a good thing that we take into account what people think about privacy. Uh, I, of course, I agree. But I think perhaps we are uh, um, not giving enough importance to what people do not think yet or should think um, about privacy. And I was wondering, this, uh, question, a small question to Nicole, because you, you seem to, to say we could uh, replace in a way the privacy that we have been is using as intimacy and recognition. But I have the feeling that the, both intimacy and recognition are too much about what, what we perceive, what like a feeling of intimacy or something that we perceive as recognition. And then all of this uh, secret data processing or untransparent data process processing that is ongoing, for me it's not captured by intimacy or recognition because it's not, uh, it's less uh, palpable, it's less manifest. And because I've heard some comments about data protection, uh, it's, it's not about controlling data. Maybe with people don't perceive it always as controlling data, and it's not only about controlling data. But I think only by controlling some kind of data, we can also start to, to get into the algorithms, okay? Because this, this basic algorithm that we are indeed not supposed to uh, question from a data protection perspective, which is, are you a man or a woman? Yeah. I had a, uh, yesterday in an interesting discussion with somebody here at this conference, a privacy expert, and as a privacy expert, she had been into uh, the Google uh, possibility that <coughs> Google gives you the possibility to know if you're a woman or a, or a man according to Google, and she was uh, a man. <coughs> we had the, the this be probably because she was looking into engineering stuff and then she was categorized as a man. So I still have to do it to see if I'm a man or a woman according to Google, but I think this is one of the first things that we have to ask and that we can only ask in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so we, <laughs> this kind of question that for me we still need some uh, grip on data processing that is on there. I don't know how could this be. Yeah, what's media? But I don't mean when, when I don't say that we have to get rid of it um, of the concept all at once. But when I hear the emotion and the scream around privacy and then these days around security and uh, when it's true that I feel that this sort of polarization, excessive polarization, and seeing it as a trade-off, which I know is not in the I, I like I, I heard once that uh, framing privacy and security as a trade-off is an idiocy. I'm glad to hear that, but still I see that it's all over all the mouse uh, when you speak about it uh, in a sort of uh, current way. Uh, I think because we have a vision that privacy is precisely the right to be left alone, the right to hide, where you, there is a lot of things behind that right that is not well enough unfolded and discussed for what it really is. So it's a sort of black box. Uh, and in front of it, security is also a black box. So we see a trade-off because the sort of, I don't know, it's just a, a conjecture that under privacy is achieved if you are left alone and security is achieved if someone somewhere knows everything about everybody and can ensure nothing goes wrong, okay? So these two simplistic visions are the one grounding the idea that there is trade-off. But for example, when I see cable TV, CCTV video, and, and I see people screaming that it is, uh, I say, okay, it's true that as, as women in the public space, I don't feel totally reactionary or to, to say that, uh, that, that I think uh, this, this, this may help, okay? So I, I understand there are different arguments, but I wouldn't scream for the, the fact that fundamental rights are at stake with that. I, you may say that there are better ways to use money, that it doesn't achieve, or there are a lot of things that could be said, but not that fundamental rights 
And also, I think that we will not avoid having to go through instance or example where public authority make a bad use of uh, knowing something about someone. Uh, we, we have to have this case to, uh, to shape what, as a society, we, we think. Thinking that we have to act always preventively to avoid that, to put the principles in front because otherwise we take the risk of having, uh, I don't know, a totalitarian regime coming back in Brussels or all, all this attitude, I think, has a big price and um, it, it, to, to, to cope with things which are much more current and common concerns. So, so that would be my There are two more comments I think you Very small question to Madame Steve. You say uh, people care, the young people care a lot about uh, what uh, what peers at Facebook did to another. Did they do something about it? Um, typically, what they do um, is op often, I, I do research with boys and girls, often what boys will do is lie. Um, so uh, um, they'll just put false information. In fact, it, it's fun to talk to them because they'll say, I put this little fine, tiny lie over here, and then I watch to see how it came back to me, and then I try to figure out who actually was using it, and all this kind of thing. Um, girls typically rely on technical privacy protection, so they're they're really into the you know the privacy settings and that kind of thing. Yeah. And their frustration is that they're ineffective. So oh, privacy settings do nothing against what I think Oh, but, uh, precisely. So um, uh, what they say, what basically they say, we'd love to do something about it, but it's a big bad world, and you guys made it, and we have no power in this world, so we play with it, but we can't really make it the way we want it. Definitely a power. Very short last comment. If we're going to stick to the attention span that we have and say let's just give attention to what we want to understand, and we're being tricked into things behind our back. I think that's a very bad policy. And I, I really care about that. I, I have one comment. Uh, we, uh, a number of times, we, we knew, we knew, I heard in our part of the world, since I'm not going to put the legislation to go. Now, I think we live in one world. And so I wonder how we can match your stories with the other stories about, about concerns and privacy online, hyper-connectivities, and, 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 and a world where that is not the issue. I completely agree with what you said. If, if, if we had more time, one of the questions I had on my panel was like, so what are actually the recommendations? What do we make out of this? I think it's really important to have time for thought and for analysis and to think about concepts, but at the same time, I think Maybe at the next conference we would need a second panel which gets more to the practical like so what do we make of this, what are the recommendations that come out of this research, uh, where do we go from here and where is actually the, the, the bridges between these different aspects and uh, so we'll have to leave it at that.